Hello, I'm Katie Jarvis. This episode of Real Foot Forward is brought to you by Buddy's Record Service in Union City. Request the best and call Buddy's for all your auto needs. Welcome. How are you, Micah? I'm doing great. How are y'all? Fantastic. It's great to have you here. Um, because because we're doing this uh, via Zoom, we get to see your really groovy background there. Uh, <laughs> at the restaurant. That's cool. Okay, so I want to start back at the beginning. I know that you were uh, a preacher's kid like I was. So tell me a little bit about where you grew up and how you grew up and, and that story. So I was born in Murray. Um, we lived around here for a good while, and I've lived everywhere from Rutherford, Tennessee, to Alabama, to West Virginia. Um, we lived all over Kentucky. We lived out in Kimmer, Wyoming, UP of Michigan. Um, so I've been a little bit of everywhere. And people always say, are you running from the law? Nope, just a preacher's kid. That's all it was, just a preacher's kid. Um, I was blessed with great parents, and they taught us how to work hard. Um, and my dad always, you know, he said, Yo, as long as you're willing to work, you can always make it doing something. And so, but I had a good childhood. I mean, like I said, we've been a little bit everywhere. I've met every kind of person you'd ever imagine, every walk of life, and, and it's been good. And so, uh, somewhere along the way, in addition to preaching, your family decided they would supplement um, the income of a minister by uh, going into the restaurant business. How'd that come about? Well, actually, my dad was also drywalling on top of preaching, and he fell and off of a uh, off a lift and got extremely injured. Well, after that, he had broken vertebrae in his back and his neck. My dad's missing a large portion of his brain. Um, but he doesn't find any sort of disability, he works every day. Well, nobody would hire a drywall for this crippled. So he'd always cooked and barbecued and that's what we just ended up doing. I don't know, it just, we said, you know what? A restaurant sounds like a good idea. I don't know where that came from, but it sounded like a good idea. And at the time we were living in Berea, Kentucky. Um, and so we ended up opening a little B restaurant down in Big Hill which is dead right down below the Bria College. Um, and we were there for a little while, and that's how we got started. And was it like a barbecue joint kind of place? Yes, it was It was just a small restaurant, kind of like what we have here, but we strictly did barbecue and ribs and burgers, and, and not like we have now where we got steak and shrimp and all that. Um, and we also had a pizza restaurant that attached to it that my, at the time, 13-year-old sister ran all by herself. <laughs> and um, But we, we've actually, since all this, virus stuff we've actually brought pizza back onto the menu and been doing that here at our, our local southern reds um and everything but yeah so it was just a little bitty little bitty joint and out down the bottom of a hill in the middle of nowhere and how old how old were you um i just turned 12 okay. and i just turned 12 um i'm 34 now and so we've been right in the business right at 22 years you um, can remember you can remember when your parents said here's what we're going to do uh, were you enthusiastic? Were you surprised? Um, being a preacher's kid, we had moving a lot. We were always up for whatever. We were never that family that everything's laid out as a perfect plan, you know. So new things didn't bother us. It was exciting. I mean, so we um, we we pulled out of public school, went to homeschooling, so we could all work. And as a kid, we were working 60, 70 hours a week and doing our schoolwork and um and everything so i don't know it was it was a good life lesson you know i think it's for every kid though but it was good for me how many uh siblings how many of you were there i have got three older sisters and then myself i'm the youngest and so there's four of us total um my oldest sister was already married and moved off uh, my second oldest sister she was i believe at that time she had just gone into the marine corps and so it was my younger sister and myself i had left behind was it was it a successful business right off the bat? Did you guys start being able to pay your bills? Yeah. Actually, we got it was local support, kind of like it is here, small community. But there wasn't a whole lot of barbecue in Maria. Um, Sonny's barbecue was about the only thing anywhere near around, and so we tried to do a really good job. So it took off pretty fast, and um, we actually ended up shutting that restaurant down. We were there for maybe two years. My mother got extremely sick, and we were strictly almost all family working there, and we had a few other employees, but with the, what the surgery she had to have and stuff, we shut it down. My dad took a preacher work in West Virginia, and so that's why we left that particular restaurant. Uh, we actually sold it to a guy named Ellis Hogg, 
what, what good name to have a barbecue <laughs> restaurant. That was hog. Right, so, I bet nobody happens. believes that's really his last name. No, they don't. People are like, yeah, right, Mike. I'm like, it really was. <laughs> With two G's, not one. Two G's, not one. <laughs> so, um, so you – at some point you moved with the restaurant and did you uh, leave the restaurant business at, at any point? No, um, I have been in the restaurant business and never been out of it. Once we, okay, so we moved to West Virginia. I graduated high school at 16, um, literally days into being 16. And my dad, again, still a preacher. I'm still living at home. We decided that not everybody is made to go to, to work for somebody else every day. Not everybody's made for college. Um, I could have gone to college. I chose not to. Um, I support everybody that does because it's an amazing thing to perpetuate college. But I decided to go into the working world. Well, so we opened a restaurant there. It was a takeout restaurant, strictly takeout, in Hinton, West Virginia. A little bitty river town at the bottom down below Beckley, West Virginia. Uh, you can find it. It is on a map. I guarantee you it is on a map. Um, but – it was an immediate hit there, immediate. I'm talking automatic takeoff. There is no barbecue in that area of West Virginia at all. Like we literally brought that style of barbecue to West Virginia. When you say barbecue in West Virginia, they think you're surely talking sauce. Like it has nothing to do with the meat. Well, when you say barbecue here, we're talking about the act of actually cooking it or, or the meat. Hey, you got some barbecue. Well, we're talking about the meat there. It's sauce. Everything's a sloppy Joe there. It's pre-mixed. It's out of a can. It's garbage. Not allowed. <laughs> and so uh, so we had the restaurant there. And so, I mean, there may have been a year gap there, me graduating high school, and that where we didn't have a restaurant. But we've always worked together as a family. Um, and and we, we work like families. Sometimes we fight, sometimes we argue, but at the end of the day, we're still a family. And so that, that's been – it's been enjoyable. Um, and I've got other businesses too, but I've just expanded upon what I do here. And like I said, my dad raised me to be a hard worker, and so that's what we do. We work hard. So what is the secret to good barbecue? Patience. It's, it's just patience. Um, everybody, wants to, everybody wants to overdo. Um, I think simple is better. We strictly cook with wood, no gas, no, no electric, no nothing like that. So strictly wood. Um, I think find what you like and, and – focus on that and don't don't get too extravagant we don't season our butts or anything like that before we cook them if you can't smoke it right then there's no point in selling it and you shouldn't have to cover it up all right so buy good meat and go from there where do you where do you buy your meat from um we get all our stuff shipped in from gordon's food service so it all comes from that uh most of our pork is from swift and things like that so we don't locally outsource that just because the volume that we do and usda protocols and all the fun stamps and everything has to be on stuff. So we get it all from one supplier. Do you have one of those like outbuildings where if I drive by, there's smoke pouring out of it? And I've got my smokers right at 20 feet long and eight feet wide. And you can drive by and everybody sees it. People stop out there and they're like, can I take pictures of it? And I'm like, yeah. And they, people are really amazed at how huge it is. We can cook right at 400 bucks at a time. Wow. That's incredible. <laughs> That's yeah, you figure that's right at 4,000 pounds of meat at a time if we wanted to do it. How many turkeys, Micah? Oh, that's my mother hauling in the back. <laughs> Thanksgiving, we'll cook, I don't know, between four and 500 turkeys for Thanksgiving. And it's, it's I, I don't like turkey anymore. I hate turkey. I, I actually saw where you, where you uh, cater, you know, you can buy a whole yeah. meal. And yes. so I put on my uh, Outlook calendar – to order from you in advance of next Thanksgiving. Awesome. Awesome. We do everything incredible. and we serve it hot and on Thanksgiving day. Like people pick up on Thanksgiving day and, and you know, we've taken the restaurant business to heart. This is what we do for a living. We understand that to have this business and make it successful and really take care of our customers. We sacrifice certain days for ourselves and just kind of move. We do our Thanksgiving on a later day. We do it the next so this following Sunday normally, you know, and, and, but our customers, they pay my bills. I mean, they, they make it possible for my kids to play sports and everything else. And, and that's, you know, I mean, it's a big deal. I got five kids, so that's a big deal to me. And what else comes with that turkey? Let's just talk food because it's like close to lunchtime already. So now I'm getting hungry. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we do turkey and ham and we make homemade dressing. 
um, green beans and mashed potatoes, real mashed potatoes, not like out or out of the box mashed potatoes. And, you know, just everything. Like everything you can imagine that you want with it, we can do. And like we have people that order, we have people that don't even order turkey. They order like brisket and tenderloin. And like there's, there's very few things that we can't cook. My mother comes from a, a large family cooking background. Um, her great grandmother was Italian and was the head chef at Stouffer's whenever it was a um, hotel chain. And so when they came over here from Italy, she came in straight as a chef and cooked. And my dad, uh, he's got family from out west, does a lot of Tex-Mix and Mexican food, like legit Mexican food. And then, you know, my grandmother was from down south in Mobile, Alabama. And so you got your fried chicken and your, your soul food and your gumbos and jambalayas. And, so it's all put together. We can cook anything you want. Doesn't really matter. Like literally anything. Now I read. Um, I was looking at some of the reviews. People seem to really like the strawberry cake. <laughs> it is a fan favorite. Uh, strawberry cake, strawberry pie, both is just. Uh, people love it. Uh, we can't keep it. Like it, it, honestly, if I had a hundred pieces in here by the end of the night, there will be none. Guaranteed. And uh, it's just it's gone just super fast. Now you're only uh, 30 minutes ish from Discovery Park of America, so right. um, I uh, am uh, excited. Are you guys serving food right now while we're all quarantined? Yes, we're we're doing um, Thursday, Friday, Saturday from 11 to 8, drive-through only. Uh, we've set everything up. Um, the biggest thing I'll kind of interject this. In, in the midst of all this chaos, I keep hearing all these places saying, we're doing these extra cleaning measures, and extra this. I've never scored below a 97 on my health department score. Never. What new clean? You should be cleaning anyway. <laughs> like, <laughs> it has bothered me to pieces. You know, so we're, but we're doing the extra hand sanitizer and stuff like that and, and taking good care to make sure everything is up to, up to the standard they're asking for. And Do you so, order in advance? I'm asking for me personally because I'm yes. coming Saturday. You need to order in advance? So you can call it in, and you call it in, and you pull behind the building and get in line like you would at McDonald's. I pull up to the door, and we bring it out. They, they cash you out, do all that, and you head out the driveway on your way. And it's a pretty smooth system so far. I mean, it gets backed up a little bit, but it's definitely not like we're used to. And we only seat about 70, 75 inside. But to go from all of our business being a just drive-through kind of thing, is, is it's, it's been a hurdle, to say the least. It's been a hurdle. I am, but we're doing it. We're getting it done. Yeah, that's great. Um, well, I can't wait uh, to get out there this weekend. And I'm sure it's a beautiful drive. K Kentucky's a beautiful, beautiful – Well, it's farming tree. season, so you get to see all the tractors in the fields and, and everything like that. And You know what I mean? But I, we're blessed. Union City has always supported us, Martin. You know, all the Tennessee towns, as well as all the Kentucky towns, um, I can't complain. The community has flat come out and said, hey, we want your business. We want you to stay in business. We're here. We're going to eat. And so I'm, I'm overjoyed, to be honest with you. So how is, um, how is uh, life in – you're in Pilot Oak, Kentucky, right? Pilot Oak, big town of about – I don't know. We may have like 230 people, I think. Maybe. We don't even have an electric caution line. Like this, we got two stop signs. That's what we got. And no, no flashing lights, no, no nothing. It's just, uh, it's not even a post office. Uh, now, are your, are your kids homeschooled? No, my kids are public school. Right now, every kid's homeschooled. <laughs> and I tell you what, that NTI stuff, it's going to drive me crazy. But, um, but yeah, no, it's, no, they're public schooled. And um, they go to Wingo Elementary is where they go and Graves County Middle School. I've got a 13-year-old, a 12-year-old, a nine-year-old, a six-year-old, and a two-year-old. Wow. Four girls and one boy. The boy's the youngest. Now, are they uh, following in your footsteps in the kitchen? Um, my oldest, she comes to work. She works here at the restaurant, and my nine-year-old likes to work at the restaurant. Um, the other ones, the six-year-old, obviously the two-year-old, they're a little young still yet, but they go to their grandmother's house and cook all the time. All of them cook at the house. Um, my kids have been able to cook their own breakfast, like eggs and bacon, since they were about seven. And we get them about six or seven, they can, they can start the stove up, and, and you teach them stove safety and portions. That's, that's the first key. Uh, so I thought it was kind of funny when I was looking at your bio. I was thinking, he can actually be two guests, because you 
uh, have the restaurant business, which is fascinating. And uh, I'm uh, what before we move on, what is the name of your restaurant there in in, um, town, in Pilot Oak? Southern Reds Barbecue. And we're from the south, so that's where Southern came from. I used to have red hair up here. It used to be there used to be hair there. There's not anymore. Um, so it was, it's red. And so Southern Reds Barbecue. And it was a pretty simple name to come up with, I reckon. And but that's what we do. So um, everybody needs to come out there and check you out. I can't wait uh, to uh, have a good meal. Um, now the next business that you're in, uh, you have another business that uh, is fascinating to me. Um, my parents right now are struggling. They have a big, beautiful lake or a pond um, that they live uh, right beside. And they have all these trees around it. And there is a beaver that keeps chomping away at my dad's trees and so he's been battling those beavers he's been putting lights out there and doing things with noise and um i also think about uh the gopher on caddyshack uh when i think That's about right. yeah <laughs> so right. so how did you how did you end up in the uh wildlife management business so it started out as a hobby and my wife literally looked at me one day and said husband it's an expensive hobby. Find a way to make money with it. So, having been in business since I was a kid, I was able to, I thought about it, and I said, okay, I'm going to try and see if, you know, this is a useful thing. So, I did my research, looked into it, and I got my licenses, got my permits from the state of Kentucky and Tennessee. Um, we're currently in the process of getting our permits in Illinois as well, so we do metropolis. So, I started out small and it was a struggle. It was hard getting people. It's a rural area. So people are like, I can take care of that raccoon that's in my attic myself. Well, they started figuring out that it wasn't that simple. It wasn't that easy. The beaver in the ponds, things like that. People stopped. They got tired of losing thousands of dollars worth of property, you know, to flooding or trees getting cut down or levees getting blown. So they let somebody start coming in with a guarantee saying, I can fix this problem. And so we go in take care of the problems and um and it grew it was started out as me and i had an old 85 chevy flatbed pickup truck that's what i started out with and now i've got three vehicles on the road running all the time um we cover a huge area and yeah it's it's pretty amazing but it's taken years i've been in that business for oh this will be our eighth year and it's taken it's taken six years to get it to to where i really wanted it to be and now people laugh and say Micah. We laughed when you started it, but now, good job. That's what they say, just good job. And so, but we do everything from from starlings to pigeons. All the way, I do bee cutouts. I cut bees out of people's homes and stuff like that. That's pretty cool. Um, so I want to come back and visit that, but first I want to say the name because um, did you just <laughs> automatically say, you know what, my name rhymes with beaver, so I'm going to put that in the. Actually, it started out as West Kentucky Wildlife Management, but. A gentleman that I'm friends with started a business as well sometime after I did, and his name was that. So I just said, you know what? I want to get something a little more personalized so that people say, that's that guy. Well, now it's Seavers Beavers, and nobody – now people never say the wildlife management part, but nobody forgets it. And <laughs> the best question I get with my name is, like, well, I know what a beaver is, but what's a Seavers? <laughs> It's my name. I'm a Seaver. It's me. <laughs> so I do. I do enjoy that question. It's always fun. So what's what's it like? Um, I read a little bit about a project you had where there was an elementary school um, that had been overtaken by starlings, and you had to go in, and the kids couldn't even play or have recess because there was so much bird droppings and dead. Yeah and eggs and t talk us through a little bit of what of the process that you go through so so that particular place had already gotten another company come in before us and they had tried a couple things and and i don't like temporary fixes if we're going in to do something like that i like permanent stuff don't have to worry about it again and so we took some time and really put some effort into deciding what we we're going to do on that project but literally when you'd walk up the concrete was just white and where all the birds were nesting and stuff and the architectural structure they had built looked pretty. All the walkways looked pretty, but they made super great nesting sites. And so we got in there and my brother-in-law is my right-hand man. And he works with me and 
we drew the plan up, got in there, and it took some work. And they had a bell tower. It was just a, it was a, it was a, a lot of different things. So we actually used we we netted a lot of stuff in, and you see a lot of netting at like Lowe's and stuff like that, different places. And people look at it and go, man, that looks poorly. It's all about how well you put it up. And so it's almost you don't even notice it. Like if you walk under there until you really pay attention, it's almost invisible. And so we netted part of it, and then we did um, some electric deterrents. It's like an electric fence for birds. We installed a bunch of that. I mean, it was just a pretty cool process. I was, I was definitely extremely pleased to get that job. What's your um, what is uh, your what has been your Bill Murray's gopher? Um, what animal have you gone after that eluded you until you finally captured it? So the the biggest struggle we have sometimes is raccoons that have already been caught, or somebody has caught them and taken them out to what they feel like is the country and let them go. We've had raccoons that have made me look stupid for a little while, and. <laughs> You know, and so you get irritated and you have to keep trying everything until you finally figure it out. I had a little bird make me look stupid at Walgreens the other day. Bird got inside a Walgreens store. I walked in, see the bird, wait for Dusty to get there a few minutes, turned around and said, hey, Dusty, the bird's right here. Turned back around, it was gone. Disappeared. Could not find it for an hour and a half we searched. Next morning they called and said, that bird's still in here. I said, where? It was hiding out in the photo booth the whole time. And nobody ever thought to look in there. And I just, it made me feel really dumb. But all the ladies thought it was pretty funny, but I did. I was like, oh, this little bird just beat me all to pieces. And in the end, bird's out, but still yet, yeah, made me look dumb for a day. So, so how do you manage your time? You're a dad with five kids. You've got a whole restaurant business. You've got a whole wildlife management business. What's I actually have another, I have another business past that too, but. That's What's that? <laughs> What's the other business? Um, it's actually, I'm getting it set up right now as a not-for-profit because I don't actually make money from it. Um, we do stuff with hunting, and we sponsor 30-plus youth hunts a year. And I line all those up, and we get kids out there hunting and fishing and things of that nature. And I also do a free meat handout. I butchered up over 7,000 pounds of meat last year um, with the help of a few volunteers. And we handed out to needy families. And no charge to the state, no charge to hunters for the hungry. We do it all out of my shop. We do it all personally. And so I do that too. What's and, your name for that? For that? Uh, we call that, that's called Beyond Blessed Land Management. And um, we have land leases and stuff like that that we manage. And we use the funds from those leases to pay for all these youth hunts. And so we have a big time with that. But I, and I'll say this, I tell people all the time, if you have the time to spend a little bit with a kid that's not yours, somebody else's, you don't always have to make an impression every day on somebody. Sometimes it's one impression that changes somebody's life forever. And, you know, I have kids that call me years later after having been on hunts and said, man, I still remember that. And, you know, sometimes people don't have the best of lives. And sometimes you take somebody like that and you show them, hey, a little bit of work. You can have fun, too. You can, you can be a good person. You don't have to be a bad person. And that one time is all it ever takes. So people think you have to put days and days and days of efforts into one kid or one adult or one teenager. You don't. Sometimes it's one good impression, and it lasts with them forever. So that's our goal behind that. And I actually just built a camp um, with 40 bunks, and we're going to start trying to do some, uh, I'm going to call them gentlemen's, gentlemen's camps. And they're going to be for 15 to 18 years old, and it's going to be for boys that maybe don't have any male interaction. And we're going to teach them. I've already got volunteers from factories and car lots. We're going to teach them how to make a deal on a car. How do you barter? How do you say, no, I don't want to pay 2000 for that. I don't want to pay 1800 But how do you do that? How do you change a tire? How do you change your oil? How do you put in an application? How do you write a check? Um, had a young man yesterday. Had never really sent a letter through the post office. And I thought they still taught that at school, but apparently they don't. And, you know, that's stuff that young men need. We're going to start out with young men and then, as I get female volunteers, we'll do a woman's one too because, you know, that needs to be women teaching them because I may have four daughters and had three sisters, but I'm still not a woman. <laughs> and, and, but um, so we really enjoy doing that. So how do I manage my time? My kids help me with everything. They're involved in my businesses. They're involved in learning. So I get to spend time with them that way. Um, in the evenings, we obviously spend time together. Um, you know, with church and Bible studies and things like that, we do that. 
Otherwise, I don't sleep as much as most people. It's a genetic thing. My dad doesn't sleep. My granddad didn't sleep. So it comes in handy, I guess. Um, and for anybody that says that their kids can't do well and have ADHD, I'm a prime example of somebody whose brain is everywhere. And the doctors have always shook their head because my parents didn't ever give us anything for it. And I just use it, you know, so my mind's all over the place. I'm always thinking. And um, I try to help support as many businesses, young people that want to start a business. I'm always there to try to help. And so I like to keep my mind going, like we're busy, we're super busy. And so, and I, you know, I guess I got to that when I was 16 and had to make a decision on what we were doing, whether I was going to go to college or the restaurant. Um, a dear friend, uh, he was older. Oh, I guess Mr. Robert O was probably 75, 76 at the time, maybe a little older than that. Um, I drove back down here and I asked him, I said, I said, what should I do? And the man was a millionaire, money, properties, everything. And he always loved my family. I said, what should I do? He said, well, son, he said, if you're not going to love it, don't do it because you'll never be great at it. And if you're not great at it, then nobody deserves to pay you for it. Well, so I took that to heart. And that doesn't mean you're not going to do stuff along the way that you maybe didn't want to do. You know, take a job at you know, this place or that place to get you to where you want to be. But it means, you know what, in the end, if you're not going to love it, you will never be great at it. You won't do it well because you'll hate the fact you're there. So find something that you're great at and really do it. And so, yeah, so I believe everybody's got something that's worth money, you know, a talent, a skill, whether you can do it for yourself or use that talent and skill to make money for yourself and somebody else, that's fine. But everybody's worth money somewhere. So, so do you do you all day long you're working on all of those projects and all or yeah. do you divide it up on certain days or no no it's all day every day it's all day every day it's all i'm all the time just everywhere and i'm i'm about the least focused person you'll ever meet but people look at me and think oh wow you must be super focused no no my brain is here and here and there and squirrel and you know that's that's how it goes it always um, has been that's my mother yelled in the background. It always has. It, it has. And I had a hard time focusing in school um, and everything. But we were taught to work hard, so I used it to my advantage. And my wife has taught me how to use spreadsheets and worksheets. And I just still don't know how to use my calendar on my phone. Like, I, I mess it up all the time. So, you know, dad's always, my dad always carries a thing in his pocket and writes everything down. And as I'm getting older and I feel like my memory's gonna start leaving me. I'm starting to write things down a little more and trying to. So yeah, I guess it's all just finding a groove and trying to get in it and go. Uh, but yeah, so I stay busy. That's incredible. Well, it's it's fascinating um, to hear uh, what all you're doing. Um, three, all all three of those areas are all three very different areas, um, <laughs> and uh, I know additionally. You actually come here to Discovery Park of America, where you have programs and, and work with our wildlife folks. Talk a little bit about that. So I enjoy doing those so much. Um, I love teaching kids. I love educating, even adults. Um, those programs are always fun. And I always like, I've always got to go, oh, I want to watch the other people's programs too. So I got to watch my time because I enjoy learning. Um, you got to study constantly, no matter what, you, what field you're in. And, but I enjoy coming there and doing that. And all the kids are so receptive. They, they're like little sponges and they want to hear about the beavers. And I bring furs and stuff like that. We talk about different things and, and traps amaze people nowadays. Even standard fur trapping amazes people because they don't understand it. You know, people have this barbaric view of it in their minds, but there's been so many advances. We release animals all the time. Um, we don't have a huge amount of gray foxes around here. So I release all female gray foxes we catch unharmed they run away and you know so it's it's a different thing than what people realize and, and then there's kids that ask me you know about getting into the business that i'm in you know how can they do that well because it sounds a lot of fun we catch snakes and, you know all this other stuff and and i love talking to kids about how they can do that themselves um you know i do a program at the the boys jail here the juvenile detention center and i talk to those boys about about different things and and that's a lot of fun, too. You know, they, they're really receptive. I do a free class at my house. We'll have 150 to 200 people a year at it, and I pay for everything. And it's a big outdoor class. We do that free. We'll have 70 to 100 kids at it every year, and then the rest are their adults and parents and stuff. So, so I love educating. It's fun. I really do. 
Well, thank you. Thank you for the stuff you do for us. And thank you for the stuff you're doing for the community. And thank you for cooking that great food that I'm going to enjoy this weekend. Well, I look forward to serving you this weekend. All right. And thank you all so much for having me on. Sounds good. See you later. I'll take care. This is Scott Williams, president of Discovery Park of America. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast. Thank you for listening to Real Foot Forward. Be sure to like, subscribe, and leave us a review. Start planning your visit to Discovery Park of America by visiting discoveryparkofamerica.com. And also be sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter for the latest updates.